welcome everybody to today's uh, Tangeray large format cocktail series. Um, we've got Andrew Meltzer here, as you can see, who's going to be leading us through some um, group serves and batching um, information. And I am Tiffany Souls, a program manager with USBG. And for any of our guests that are tuning in today um, live or watching the recording afterwards um, on Diageo Bar Academy, then um, if you're wondering what the USBG is, the United States Bartenders Guild is a nationwide nonprofit association that is dedicated to uniting the hospitality community to advance professional bartending. The vision of the USBG is for every US bartender to achieve greater personal and professional success by connecting to diverse local and national hospitality communities. Um, just some housekeeping notes before we get started. If you have questions, we definitely encourage those throughout the presentation. If you'll just place those in the Q&A box, that'll be easy for um, Andrew to see and respond to. Um, if you do put it in um, the chat box, then I'll try to help um, follow along and um, let Andrew know if there's any questions in there to answer as well. We will try to get to all of them by the end of the presentation. And um, now it is my pleasure to introduce Andrew Meltzer. Andrew is the 2016 U.S. World Class Bartender of the Year. Um, he's also a two-time food and cocktail pairing champion. Um, he's a past president of the San Francisco chapter of USBG. And while he was in San Francisco, he led the bar team as a manager of um, 15 Romolo. And he was also the beverage director at an Eastern Mediterranean hotspot. Uh, he most recently can be found shaking things up in London at Happiness Forgets. And without any further ado, go ahead, Andrew, and take it over. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, like Tiffany said, I've uh, worked in lots of a uh, variety of venues from craft cocktail bars with a speakeasy vibe to nightclubs that were super high volume, but still putting together craft cocktails and making use of batching. Um, to working in, you know, upscale, but again, high volume venues where we had large rooms where we'd cater parties of 30, 40, 50, or 100 guests. So we would rely on draft cocktails and punches and um, lots of serves that could cater to many people and give them a unique, tasty, and crafty experience. So I'm really happy to be part of this um, DBA, Diageo Bar Academy programming. We've had a few classes in this series. Um, if you want, you can review them all on diagiobaracademy.com. We've had ones on a uh, gin master class, as well as things about making blended and frozen drinks. I did one on draft cocktails last week. And then today we are doing um, a portion that's featuring large format serves that could be anything from just a carafe or a pitcher of cocktails to something like a punch bowl. So I've got lots of great um, stories and some of my favorite recipes to share with you along the way. And of course, we'll also be talking a little bit about the history of the Tanqueray brand and our family of cocktail, um, of our family of gins, and just a little bit of a brief introduction to how distillation works and what makes Tanqueray number 10 so special. Um, as Tiffany mentioned, you guys are welcome to use the chat feature to talk with one another. But if you've got a question for me, use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen here, and that'll pop up. And please feel free to ask me something, even in the middle of a slide. I'd be happy to rewind and dive a little bit deeper into some of the more complicated topics, or we can save it for the end and just have an open Q&A at the end of the session. So why don't we... Um, get started here. And, um, you know, I suppose I'd say that um, there are three main reasons that you would have something like these large format cocktails on your menu. And the first thing is the immense opportunity for cost savings. So at my bar in San Francisco, where I was running for five years, our number one selling cocktail was a gin-based version of the Pimm's Cup. So we offered this as a single serve cocktail, as well as a pitcher that served five or six guests. And we also sold larger punch bowls to big parties of some classics with a twist and some of our own creations. And the punch bowls were great because they would offer 20 or 30 small serves. Now, the best thing here was that both of these were high profit margin items. 
but on a drink for drink basis from the consumer side, they're actually really affordable. So it was a great deal for our guests to go big and buy a bigger cocktail, but ultimately they'd be saving money at the end of the day. So it's definitely a win-win situation. Now, the great thing for the staff here is that a busy bartender server loves seeing a ticket where cocktail pitchers come up on an order because they know they can bang them out super quickly. And of course, I don't need to explain to you that making one large drink will always be making fa uh, be made faster than creating five or six bespoke craft cocktails. Um, and the other thing is that if you only have one or two or three maybe offerings on this like large scale menu, you can train your bar batch, your supervisors, the, even maybe your senior servers on how to make these. That way, if they're trained also to sell them on the floor, when the bartenders are in the weeds, or maybe it's just one of those weird nights where you only have one or two people working and you've got a large group that just came in, you get the whole team involved and get them trained on how to sell it and how to bang them out and make them really quickly and satisfy the needs of your tables um, without bogging down service. So it's um, a great place to save on labor and also to just make a more efficient menu that will ultimately mean more profits for your uh, business. Keeps everybody happy. Now, while we do offer a full menu of more complex, adventurous, and costlier drinks, I will say that the pitchers and punch bowls, they've got to be crowd pleasers. So you want to make sure that all of these options are refreshing, value-driven, that they're food friendly, and of course that they're suitable to the taste of the majority of your clientele. I'm not saying you should make them boring, they should just be um, really easy drinking drinks that you're not gonna have like half of the group return. Um, obviously you'll always have somebody at the large table that's gonna be more adventurous and wanna try some of your more bespoke and um, highbrow cocktails and they'll certainly be ordering them. But you do want to have something that encourages group orders and repeat group orders. So it really satisfies your guests and of course your overall revenue. Um, now, a big part of this is not just selling it when guests arrive, but a lot of the time you have a booking of maybe a dinner or just cocktail hour for a group of colleagues, or maybe there's a big birthday party coming in, they've given you advance notice or sometimes you might even have a semi-private or full buyout booking at your bar or restaurant, you should have your events manager or who's ever taking the booking get ahead of the game and pre-sell pictures or for the larger parties, whole punch bowls. This way you can be not just really organized looking when the guests arrive that you already have something on the table waiting for them, but you can start serving guests as they arrive all a minute. And not only do they feel like they've been welcomed with a tasty glass of punch, but once again, this prevents you from having um, your servers bogged down with a large group order when they've got all their other two tops and four tops to take care of. So, um, you know, in these post pandemic times, the smart business operator will also make note of all of the takeaway and bottled cocktails that are happening. I, th I see a lot of parallels actually at beer bars who for years now have been doing crowlers and growlers where you can fill up some of the draft beer, sometimes things that are only available on draft. So it also has a sort of like limited offering catch to it. And they'll be selling them in crowlers or growlers for people to take away with them. And oftentimes they're charging dine-in prices for takeaway drinks. So this is a tool that bartenders and um, servers and, and owners and managers can use to their advantage by creating a bottled cocktail menu that's available both for dine-in and takeaway service, which apart from the fact that it allows you to expand your brand's reach from not just within the bar or on your Instagram feed or whatever, but then your best customers who are taking drinks away become like a pseudo brand ambassador and whenever they're maybe going to a friend's house for a football game or a birthday party or whatever it is they're taking your brand with them and of course you're also adding to revenue and to the staff tips since most people will end up still tipping a little bit extra even on these takeaway drinks 
And, uh, you know, one more thing about the large format cocktails is I think the fun part in it, because, you know, a lot of people come for an experience at the bar and sometimes that experience is five people at a table all ordering five different cocktails and tasting them with one another. But when you do a pitcher of drinks instead for them, you can make up for this experience in other ways. So um, with a large format drink, the benefit is that, of course, it arrives quickly at the table, so everybody gets safe, um, their needs taken care of, but your server can also do some sort of table-side serve. So it could be something really small and easy, like just having the server pour from the pitcher a small glass for everybody at the table, which just really shows your high quality standards of service and that you're not neglecting them even though they just ordered one big easy pitcher. But you could also, for example, do a um, punch bowl where the bartender will come out from behind the bar. And a good example would be creating most of the punch like a French 75 behind the bar where you'll have a cold bottle of Tanqueray number 10 and you pour it over ice block with some fresh lemon juice and a bit of simple syrup and a splash of water to give it a little dilution. Then you bring this punch bowl over to the table and you finish it with champagne table side and then garnish it with some dried lemon wheels and a few mint sprigs. And not only is this a fun experience for the guests because they see you pouring in a whole bottle of sparkling wine and they're like, oh, wow, we're really getting our money's worth. But this also gives them an opportunity to talk with the expert bartender or for your guests, maybe even to um, have a variety of garnishes brought to the table and your server or bartender might explain the differences between them so that each guest can garnish their own cup individually. Um, so there are lots of little things that you can do to elevate the experience that might not even be possible with a single serve cocktail. So there's an added benefit to doing the large format service here. Um, now, if you are going to add some large format cocktails to your menu, there are a few options at your disposal. And depending on how you approach it, each recipe will be uh, taken in slightly differently. So the three main categories that you'd look at are cocktail pitchers, punch bowls, and bottled cocktails. And I'll break them each down in a moment. Um, but I want to recite the fact that your staff has got to be really well trained on selling these drinks. Um, because when a staff come, when a, a large group comes in, it is got to be the number one priority of your staff to understand that labor is expensive and consumes so much of the ability for your guests to be taken care of across the board. So if your staff knows to sell a pitcher or punch bowl first things first, it really frees up a lot of time and allows you to focus on high quality service, not just for the big group, but for all the other tables that are hanging out there. Um, so, you know, it all starts at the top with your managers and owners training the staff. Now, um, if you're gonna make a carafe or a pitcher of cocktails, this is probably the easiest one to take a classic cocktail recipe and scale it up by multiplying the ingredients by three, four, or five times. However, I will say, this is very important, you can only use this sort of scaling technique with highballs and other long drinks. So maybe you've got a crappy gin and soda or gin and tonic serve, a Moscow Mule, a, mo a mojito, or a sangria. These are all drinks that initially in a single serve are quite long and refreshing with a bit of sourness, and they can be scaled up quite easily, but only as high as three, four, five times to fit into a craft or a pitcher. Um, now, the traditional sour cocktail, like a gimlet or a south side, or something like a boozy stirred drink, such as a Manhattan old fashioned martini Negroni, those are not gonna work well in this case. Um, later on, we'll talk about some bottled cocktails that work well for these um, boozy stirred drinks. But in terms of your pitchers, I would recommend avoiding these stronger, stiffer drinks because they're honestly just not gonna fill up the volume that you need in a craft or a pitcher. And if you did manage to fill up an entire pitcher with one of these cocktails, 
it might encourage your guests to overconsume, and you don't want to deal with that for many reasons. So I would just make sure that the key traits of your pitcher or carafe are the following. You want them to have moderate sourness. They should have a very high refreshment. And then you can have a good dose of something fruity or something spiced. So, um, for example, at my restaurants and bars I operate, all of the pitchers that we have are made with a base spirit, some fresh fruit juice or a puree, and a, um, a, a bit of like either a flavored syrup, like ginger syrup, vanilla, or pomegranate, or some sort of fruit or flower liqueur. But the most important thing is that we've got a lengthener. So that could be soda water, ginger beer, um, a cold brew tea, or sparkling wine. Generally something tall and fizzy. Um, but the important thing to remember here is that because the lengthener takes up a large volume of the recipe, it's got to be kept ice cold. Now the reason that you want this cold, all of the ingredients chilled, but especially your soda water, ginger beer, etc., is that once it hits the ice in the pitcher, if it's a warm mixer, it's going to dilute the ice very quickly. If it's cold, it will not only maintain the integrity of the bubbles and they won't disappear so quickly, but it also means that the pitcher or the carafe will stay cold and give guests plenty of time to enjoy it at their leisure. Now, say you're making a punch bowl, which would often be 10, 20, or 30 serves, depending on the size of bowl that you're offering you're gonna approach the recipe from a different angle. Now, the key components of a great punch are refreshment, lightness, smoothness, and longevity. So to find this balance, you're actually gonna use much less citrus and much less sweetener than you would in a single serve version of a similar cocktail. Now, you don't want the drink to be particularly sour or cloyingly sweet. Rather, you want this like velvety, smooth, and crispy, clean texture. And what this does is it ensures that you're gonna have a nicely balanced cocktail over an hour or two. Because generally, if you've got a big party of say 40, 50 people that have bought out portion or an entirety of your bar, they might be coming in very slowly and you want the person that got there first versus the person that got there an hour later to have a very similar tasting glass of punch. And you know, you also might have a group order a bowl of punch, and then once people are getting the ball rolling, they're ordering more bespoke handmade cocktails, and the punch bowl will just be sitting there. So you want to make sure that it can last them at least an hour or two. Now, um, I like to um, prepare as many of these ingredients in advance as possible. So when I have a pre-ordered bowl of punch for say a buyout or a large party that's made a booking in advance, I like to mix the base spirits, the juices and the sweeteners together. And I put them in a Cambro or some plastic container in the fridge or on an ice bucket and cool them down. And then assemble this mixture over your block of ice just as the guests arrive. And finally topping it up with cold tea, soda water, ginger beer, sparkling wine. And again, this could be something that you do. You know, at my bar, we had a big whiskey barrel and we would set the punch bowl on top of the whiskey barrel and then have an assortment of garnishes, punch cups, and then the sparkling wine. And we would pour the majority of the sparkling wine on it as we were presenting the punch bowl to guests. And then maybe after half of the ice block had been diluted, we would pour on that remaining third of the bottle of sparkling wine just to give it a nice bit of a refresher. Um, but with the regard to the ice block, I will say this is probably the most important part of having a successful punch program. If you just use regular ice that you're shaking your cocktails with, even if it's high quality cold draft ice, like the one inch by one inch solid cubes, those are not gonna last long. After 20 or 30 minutes on that sort of ice, your punch could be dead. However, if you use a block of ice, which doesn't need to be fancy, you don't need to buy ice from one of the delivery companies, you can certainly make this in a deep freezer, walk-in freezer. All you need is a two to four quart container. You could use like a bunt style cake pan or simply like a four quart plastic uh, Lexan or Cambro container, just not glass, of course, because that could break. 
And um, I would recommend filling it up at least two days ahead of time with filtered water. Tap water will work, but you will certainly get some cloudiness. I would say using filtered water is your best bet. Or you could even take some ice from your cold draft machine, put that into the container, and then fill it up with filtered water to fill in the gaps. That will also expedite the time in which it takes for this block to be frozen. Now, at my bar, we kept a par of three ice blocks in the freezer at all times. Since they do take a while to freeze, and sometimes a group of 15 guys will come in after the game, and they all want to hang out, and you're like, oh my god, I've only got one bartender on, the other person's on break. My server sells them full of punch, boom, running back, grab one of the ice blocks, and this party of 15 is dealt with, and they'll take care of themselves. Now, um... It, like I said, it's important to have your punch ingredients chilled ahead of time because when you pour them over the block of ice, if you've got room temperature gin and barely chilled lemon juice and liqueurs and you pour them over a, a frozen block of ice, it could easily crack the ice in half and make it look less pretty and less effective, of course. But if you've pre-chilled most of these ingredients and some bars will even pre-make all of the... Um, non-perishable punch ingredients and bottle them. That way it's easy as pulling that bottle out of the fridge, adding the appropriate amount of grapefruit or lemon juice or whatever, and then topping up with your um, chilled lengthener, like some wine or bubbles. Then it's as easy as one, two, three, and you can get everything going. Now, um, I do like to keep this one handy dandy rhyme in the back of my head whenever I'm either putting together something at a friend's house and I have a limited supply of ingredients, or if I'm with my bar team and we're coming up with creative new cocktails for our punch program, the best recipe to follow is this. And it goes four of strong, four of weak, one of sour, one of sweet. Now, four of strong is four parts of a spirit like Tanqueray number 10 or some great blended whiskey vodka with tequila or rum. Uh, your four parts of weak, of course, might be water, but I like to use, instead of water, some cold brewed black green rooibos or herbal tea. Or, of course, you could use something fizzy like sparkling wine. Champagne counts as water in my book. And you could even use some tonic or ginger beer. If you are going to use tonic, I would split it with soda water. Otherwise, you might um, be having a bit too much sweetness and intense bitter flavor. And then you've got in the rhyme, four of strong, four of weak, one of sour, one of sweet. So one part sour would be your lemon, lime, or other uh, citrus juice. And then one part of sweet could be a combination of both syrups and liqueurs. So if you compare this to something like a margarita or a daiquiri, you'd notice that we're actually using significantly less proportion of sour and sweet components and a little bit higher proportion of dilution. Normally when you shake or stir a cocktail, you're only adding 20 or 30% uh, dilution. Here, we've got nearly one-to-one -one parts of your base spirit and your dilution, whether that's tea or sparkling wine. So it's not just that you're watering down the cocktail, you're also adding flavor and a little bit of tannin or um, some little bit of bite from the bubbles. And what this does is it, add a sort of quaffable lightness and freshness to the drink without needing to add um, too much sourness or sweetness that would not only give it a short life, but also make it pretty intense and probably prevent people from going back for a second, third, or fourth cup. All right, so now that you've got pitchers and punch bowls covered, let me dwell on bottled cocktails for a moment. For these drinks, you can use similar recipes to your carafe or pitcher version by taking a classic long drink and scaling it up by just a few times. But here it's best to avoid fresh fruit juices and purees or really anything that's cloudy and has a short shelf life. Now your goal for the bottled cocktails is something that is clean and refreshing with great clarity. Now, there are a lot of hacks to get here. So if you're using a drink that would normally call for fresh lemon or lime juice or orange or grapefruit, what you can do is a simple clarification technique. Um, one, like 
thing that we've taken from the molecular gastronomists um, is agar agar, which is basically a powdered gelatin that you can mix with your lemon juice and freeze it, and that will clarify it and make it really shelf stable. Or even more simply than that, you can take your fresh lemon or lime juice, filter it through a coffee filter or a nut milk bag, which is what you'd use to make oat milk or almond milk. Um, so you'd filter it, it takes a little while, but you're gonna have a very pure, clean citrus juice. And you could even add an acid solution of water mixed with citric acid or ascorbic acid powder. And these act as stabilizers and antioxidants. So while you still get the freshness of your juice, you've also added a stabilizing um, acid powder, which gives you a much longer shelf life. And again, aids in clarity. And um, I say clarity, not only because it looks good on the shelf or in the bottle in somebody's fridge at home, but also because a clear drink will last much longer and you'll have a much better chance of the drink tasting as fresh as it did on day one, even a week or two later. Now, there are a few other hacks here. If you wanted to emit the fresh citrus juice, you could use an alternative uh, liquid acid, such as a high quality organic apple cider vinegar, you just use much less than you would with lemon juice. Um, or I love using some high quality white wine or champagne vinegar. And when I say high quality, I mean the best that you can afford because this is a vinegar that you're drinking rather than cooking with. So it's got to taste really tasty. And although you might spend a few extra dollars on a bottle, a little bit will definitely go a long way. And again, it's something that you can dilute with water or like a cold brute herbal tea so that you have a really nice um, mouthfeel and flavor and a bit of tartness so that there's a, a really nice balance and complexity to the cocktail. Um, now, if you do want to add, say, some fruit puree or maybe a homemade ginger syrup or something that's a little bit cloudier. One great tool is to infuse your base spirit, like your gin or some whiskey or vodka, with the fruit puree and your syrups or anything that's cloudy. You can mix them all together and then put them in the fridge overnight or for a day or two. You'll taste it as you go. And then strain all of that off through a coffee filter, a chinois, which is a fine mesh filter that the chefs use, or once again, through a nut milk bag, which is a great alternative to a coffee filter because it's reusable and a bit more environmentally friendly. So if by doing this, you're infusing, um, for example, all the flavor of passion fruit puree into something like Tanqueray number no. 10 gin and then straining it off so that you don't have cloudiness, but you have even some of the texture brought into the cocktail by way of infusing with the gin. Um, one last note on the bottle cocktails is that you can use these boozy stirred drinks like martinis, old fashions, Negronis in Manhattans. And um, I would just make sure that you dilute them. Maybe not 100% of the dilution that you would find when you bottle, when you stir a cocktail, you're generally adding 20 or 25% water after you've stirred it appropriately. Maybe you add 15 to 20% water to your bottled cocktail because nearly all guests, when they take a bottled cocktail home, will serve it over ice. Unless you have explicit instructions that say, just shake this up in the bottle and pour it up in a cocktail glass um, because it's already at proper dilution. Some guests might read that. Others might not even have the space in their fridge to keep the bottle appropriately chilled and they're going to pour it over ice anyway. So the last thing you want is for them to spend money on a bottled cocktail, take it home, and then find that it's, um, you know, too watery by the time they drink it. All right, so a uh, picture here is a basic set of tools that you would need for your large format cocktail program. I'd say everything here is pretty standard issue equipment um, for the average bar and restaurant. Um, there's a few things to mention. There's these swing top glass bottles in the middle and also on the bottom left there are some plastic bottles. These are going to be good for your bottled cocktail or takeaway program. Of course the glass ones can be a bit more expensive so you'll need to factor that into the price of the takeaway drinks. Um, and you know when I'm pricing out takeaway cocktails but I'm also pouring them in-house, 
I would generally serve them, say it's like a 10 or $12 cocktail for dine-in price. You might offer a 20 or 25% discount if somebody's taking it away. Um, I wouldn't discount it much more heavily than that, or it kind of takes away from the value of this being a craft cocktail that you guys have put all this love into. And just keep in mind, even if it's something as simple as Negroni, many guests don't have the ingredients, the tools, or the know-how to make a great Negroni at home. I know it seems so simple for us bartenders, but um, you can still make a good deal of extra money by serving great old fashions and martinis and things like that as a takeaway on top of your, you know, more bespoke and creative cocktails. Um, anyway, back to the slide here. There's also some things like a uh, bunt pan, which is something that you could use to make an ice block that has a nice shape to it. And the cool thing about that is you might even put some dried flowers or orange slices or something that will freeze in there. And then you can have this nice, um, you know, frozen ornamental ice block for your punch bowl. I will just give you a word of caution that if you have stuff like a slice of orange in there, it does mean that the ice block will have a difficult time becoming crystal clear. So you might have excessive cloudiness and you could even like burst the cells that contain the juice in the orange. And while it might now have an orange flavor or scent to the ice block as it's melting, it will certainly change the flavor of the punch. Um, it will definitely melt a little bit faster and it won't look as good and it might crumble as it's melting. So maybe experiment and start just with some dried flowers or something that is going to be um, a little less problematic with your ice block. Um, anyway, you'll also see a kettle here and I just want to recite that I love using cold brewed or traditional hot brewed teas as my water either in punches, but also it's a really great tool to use this in your bottled cocktails since it adds a really nice subtle background flavor and it's a great way to integrate flavors. Um, and for me, I like to incorporate tea programs at my bars and restaurants that either use teas from the country where my cuisine is from. So I ran a Mediterranean restaurant and we found some teas from a group of women that were foraging for wild herbs and blending the teas as part of a woman-owned cooperative. So the teas had a really good story and we incorporated them into a lot of our cocktails. But there's also a great way to get in touch with your community and maybe you can find a local tea blender and feature their cocktail, uh, their ingredients in your cocktail, which is just something that you can be proud of and guests love supporting local small businesses. So it's a really good uh, insight you might want to incorporate into your program. Now, let's review a few of the important things that we've just discussed about the large cocktail programs here. Um, now, it is of the utmost importance that all of your ingredients for the large group serves are as cold as possible. That means your soda, tonic, ginger beer, and sparkling wine are chilled for the pitchers and carafes. And all of your ingredients, including your base spirits, are um, chilled. And that means you could even keep your gin and vodka and stuff frozen if you're going to be using it for punches and you keep them cold or mix all the ingredients and put it in the fridge before you add it to your ice block. That way everything stays colder and more refreshing for a longer amount of time. And of course, it also prevents the ice block from cracking or falling to pieces. And um, if you're going to bottle cocktails, either for dining or takeaway service, they should be filtered and fined um, so they're as clear as possible. And of course, you want to keep all of these things cold. So maybe you have a designated fridge uh, or part of the walk-in fridge in the back where you have all these bottle and takeaway cocktails just to maximize their shelf life. Now, when you're adjusting recipes for the pitchers and carafes, it's best to start with long drinks that already use a lengthener like soda or ginger beer. And for the punch bowls, you'll use less sweet and sour components so that you have a lighter, velvety, and crispy clean cocktail that lasts for a long time. And remember the rhyme, four of strong, four of weak, one of sour, one of sweet. And that's a great way to start, whether you're adjusting a French 75 or a mojito or something like that. 
uh, it's a good rule of thumb to follow when you're making a big, big batch of drinks. Now, your service staff and events manager should be well versed on how to sell pitchers and punch bowls. And especially the events manager when they're taking big reservations, they should have this sold before the guests even arrive at the bar. Now, you should also have some bottled cocktails, a cool takeaway, and you could even include with them things like a branded newsletter, some stickers with your logo on it, or even some special garnishes. And this will help add to your sales and bring in more tips for your staff while also allowing your guests to take a bit of the bar experience home with them. Now, uh, you can use some of the time that you save behind the bar and on the floor uh, by making exciting tableside experiences. Like I said, this could mean garnishing or finishing the cocktail um, by the bartender or server table side. And I also recommend that you have appropriately sized glassware to go with all of these. So for pitchers, I like to use a six to eight ounce juice glass, like a small orange juice glass. And even though I would normally serve the same cocktail in a 10 or 12 ounce glass, by using the slightly smaller one, it means that each guest will get at least one or two refills and it makes them feel like they've gotten more value out of their punch or out of their pitcher, excuse me. Now, as far as the punches, um, I, it really is venue specific. So you could use antique teacups like porcelain cups, and you can find a lot of these in bulk on eBay or at thrift stores and Goodwills and things like that. Or you could use some traditional punch glasses. Again, you can find a lot of them at antique stores and yard sales even. Um, but a classier venue might want to use an aperitif glass or an Amaro glass or a small wine glass. Uh, or maybe your, uh, you know, brown leather, dark wood whiskey bar and you have a huge whiskey selection. You could use some small rocks glasses for your punches here too. Um, whatever it is, you know, make something that fits in with the rest of your glassware program. And then um, when it comes to garnishing the punches, of course, I like to garnish the punch bowl only because I'm a traditionalist and I don't believe that every single cup needs to be garnished. But I see more and more, especially in upscale trendy venues or restaurants and hotels, you'll see a punch bowl will come served with some garnishes in it, but also with a variety of um different garnishes that guests can use. It kind of reminds me of the myriad gin and tonic offerings where it's 15 kinds of gins, 15 kinds of tonic, and each one gets a different specialized um, botanical or dried fruit and herb that can be used as a garnish. And sometimes guests are allowed to mix and match and create their own. So just a great fun experience for guests to customize their own drinks. Now, um, here's a snapshot of four classic, very simple cocktails that can be easily adapted to large format serves. So I encourage you to get creative and adjust these um, as it fits your needs and the skill level of your bartenders and of course, the tastes of your guests. So um, on the left is a Cuddle One Vodka Lemonade. And this is a great example of a long drink that could be used for pitchers and carafes or as well for bottled serves if you could clarify everything pretty well. Um, now then there's a Southern style punch that could highlight Crown Royale Deluxe. And in my opinion, I would serve this maybe with some cold brewed black tea or rooibos tea and then add a bit of lemon juice and a bit of a peach liqueur. Um, and in some cases, you might even add a dash or two of Angostura bitters, but I generally try to avoid bitters and Amaro or other bitter liqueurs in my punches because those things can bloom or blossom in the punch bowl, which means that when you're building the cocktail, it tastes really good. And then 30 minutes or an hour later, all you can taste is Angostura bitters or whatever is in there. A little bit is fine. Just reduce it by maybe... Um, five or 10. So using, you know, 10 or 20% of the amount of bitter ingredients that would go into a standard size cocktail. So you're just really lowering that. Anyway, like I said, a really nice crown royal punch might have some peach liqueur, lemon juice, and black tea or something like that. Next, we have Johnny Walker Black Label Whiskey Sour. 
And I think that this could be bottled and then served on the rocks. Or if you wanted to make a carafe or pitcher, you could take a classic sour like this um, without the egg whites in this case, and then serve it with some soda water in a carafe or pitcher. And that would lengthen the cocktail and make it much more suitable for guests to share. And then on the end here, um, we've got a classic punch bowl that could feature Tanqueray number 10. And I think that a good example of this would be something that I actually recently did, which was uh, with some green tea, lemon juice, and either a dash of um, clarified lemon juice or just a squeeze of fresh lemon juice, but really not much lemon at all. You really want to highlight the botanicals in the gin and then have the like um, subtle umami seaweed flavors of a really nice high quality cold brewed green tea with a dash of honey to sweeten it. Um, and another great option might be to do like a Paloma style cocktail using Don Julio Reposado tequila with some fresh lime juice and some grapefruit soda. And you could maybe even add a dash of triple sec or orange liqueur or something so that you've got a little bit more complexity. That's a really great option for a punch bowl. Anyway, I also recommend that you check out DiageoBarAcademy.com where you'll find a lot more variations on these cocktails and other great uh, recommendations for large format serves. Uh, anyway, those are my thoughts on punches, pitchers, carafes, and punch bowl and uh, bottled cocktails. Please add some questions into the Q&A box up here and I'll answer them um, throughout the rest of the session here. Uh, but I would like to chat a little bit about um, gin and its history, how we distill Tanqueray, and then I'll move into a demonstration and chat about one of my own favorite recipes that we've made for punches at my cocktail bars. All right, so what exactly is gin? Well, I'm sure many of you can answer this, but it starts off with a neutral spirit. It's essentially similar to vodka, but this neutral spirit can be made from wheat, rye, barley, grapes, potatoes, sugar beets, basically anything that can be fermented and distilled to over 95.1% ABV becomes a neutral spirit. Now, the difference between gin and vodka is that the neutral spirit is then redistilled with botanicals. And of course, the only botanical that is required to make gin and call it gin is gin, uh, juniper. And, you know, juniper is what gives gin its earthy, piney, kind of savory and oily flavor and characteristics. But every gin on the market also has some other herbs and botanicals in it. So you might find some roots, barks, herbs, flowers, and fruits in um, a variety of proportions. Now, of course, the name gin comes from Geneva, which is the Dutch word for juniper. So it was the Dutch who first created this juniper-infused spirit, which was actually originally made from malted barley. It was very similar to whiskey. Um, and there's a lot of traditional Genevers that you can find that have a distinct malty flavor. Now, most of them, uh, the oud style, which is the German word, the Dutch word for old, oud Geneva is old style Geneva where it's been aged in barrels. And it wasn't necessarily to flavor it and give it barrel-aged characteristics or color. It was really just because it was easier to transport the spirit in a barrel. And that was what it came out looking like and tasting like. Um, but there's also young, um, which is like young spelt with a J. And the young Genevers are a more modern style where they're white and have a less malty profile. And of course, they're not aged in barrel. Anyway, um, they would initially infuse it with the juniper berries, likely for medicinal properties because it was so good as an antimicrobial and antibacterial. It had a lot of medical benefits, such as like cleaning out your kidneys and um, acting as a diuretic. Um, of course, the English eventually took a liking for this flavor and the spirit, which was also uh, given the nickname Dutch Courage because it gave the Dutch uh, army the courage to go into battle. And um, in the 17th century, the English started making gin and actually the government was giving out licenses to distill left and right, like they didn't care. They were actually just trying to promote the growth and consumption of 
um, British grain. They wanted to increase the economic value of British grain, which they had a surplus of. Um, however, the public began drinking way too much gin and the quality control dissipated, thus the quality became pretty bad. And um, by the middle of the 18th century, a tax was levied, which was supposed to control the production of gin and the quality, but this actually backfired and pushed gin production underground. So there's a huge black market for it, and it was really bad stuff. And if you look at this image on the right, it's called Gin Lane, which is part of a really famous drawing called Gin Lane and Beer Street. And it basically showed the difference between what different classes of people were drinking and how a lot of the poor and working classes were drinking tons of gin. And it was just causing a lot of social and health problems. Um, fortunately, however, the gin fever eventually leveled out and much stricter reg regulation was put into place, which guaranteed a higher quality. Now, through the centuries, we've developed four major classes of gin. Now, the most commonly found are London Dry and New Western, and that will um, compromise the bulk of the gin brands that are on your back bar. Now, the first, um, such as Tanqueray's London Dry Gin, is dominated by juniper. So when you're tasting a London Dry Gin, the juniper flavor should stand out amongst its fellow botanicals, and that should be the dominant flavor. On the other hand, you've got modern uh, New Western style gin. And that's what a lot of the 6,000 gins on the market, they fall into this category. This is where there's an aroma and flavor profile that's dominated by other botanicals. Generally, it's more fruity and more floral, but sometimes you also have unique botanicals in there that take the spotlight. So you could find ones where cardamom or green apple are the star of the show. Um, they still have juniper in it, but it's generally more of a background botanical. Uh, so Tanqueray number 10 is a great example of this because it, it actually features the same four base botanicals as Tanqueray London Dry. However, in number 10, we've added whole citrus fruits as well as some chamomile flowers, and this gives it a really dish, delicious complex flavor and unique mouthfeel. Now, the other two types of gin should not be skipped over. Uh, on the left, we've got Old Tom Gin which is called Old Tom and also had the nickname of Bathtub Gin um, because in those days, the dark days of the 18th century, a lot of people were illegally making gin at home and sometimes the infusion with juniper and other botanicals would be literally done in their bathtub. Now, the sad thing is at this time, a few hundred years ago, the gin sometimes had dirty things added to it like turpentine and you know lots of chemicals or sugar were added to it to cover up these nasty ingredients. And that's what made it, you know, uh, potentially blinding or can make you really sick. Um, but the old Tom gins definitely had a bit of a sweetness and sometimes they were kept in barrels, again, out of convenience, not necessarily to add flavor to it or anything. But nowadays there are some great brands that make amazing old Tom gin. Tank Ray has made an old Tom gin several times in limited edition. And then there's other great brands out there. Sometimes they're sweetening it with sugar. Other times they're adding a lot of licorice root as one of the botanicals. And licorice root has a very unique property that adds the perception of sweetness and adds a really rich texture to the gin. Uh, additionally, some old Tom gin producers are barrel aging it. So you'll see a bit of color um, and others might just be adding a caramel color to give you that effect. Finally, we've got Plymouth Gin, and this is the only one that's made by only one brand, by Plymouth, and they're actually in Plymouth, England, which is in the southwestern part of the country, and it's actually one of the oldest gin brands in the world, and it's unique because it has this velvety soft texture um, with more of like a spicy citrus flavor. It has some cardamom and lots of citrus peel, and it is not quite as juniper dominant as a London dry. It's not quite as floral or fruity as the New Western. And it's just a special gin, so it gets its own category and everybody should try it. Um, now that you understand the different styles of gin, let me tell you a little bit about the history of Tanqueray and what makes the, grant, the brand so interesting and why it's one of the number one selling gins around the world. So, of course, everything started when Charles Tanqueray was born in 1810 outside London. 
he actually came from a family of pastors and he was in line to become a pastor himself or work with the church. But him and his brother decide to go down a different path and they both took a job at a local distillery. Now, Charles was always scientifically minded person, very mathematical, very much studious kind of guy that took notes on everything. So while he was learning all the different roles at this distillery, he took notes on every part of the gin production process. Um, in 1835, him and his brother actually had the opportunity to take over another gin brand. Of course, they renamed it after themselves, the Tanqueray Gin Company. And um, he actually helped pioneer this new London dry style. So at this point in time, most distillers didn't have really good distillation technique. And many of them were using a traditional pot still to make their um, base spirit. So it still had a lot of kind of oily characteristics and richness, and it wasn't as clean of a spirit as Mr. Tanqueray was making because Mr. Tanqueray was using the new continuous still. Now continuous still looks kind of like a chimney and it has all of these plates in it that um, help cleanse the, the spirit before it comes up as a vapor. And I'll t teach you a little bit more about that in a minute. But anyway, the idea is that Tanqueray, Mr. Tanqueray was making a much better neutral base spirit. And that gave him the opportunity to be more thoughtful with his additional uh, botanicals and make a really, really unique gin. Now, uh, as I mentioned, Charles was a man of great detail and experimentation, and he left really careful notes. You can actually still read his notebook today, and you'll see that he actually went through over 300 different recipes when he was doing R&D before he came up with the perfect recipe of, like I said, only four botanicals to create his signature London dry gin. Now, being a London dry gin, like I said, it's essential that the primary botanical is juniper. But a gin like Tanqueray, although an experienced taster might be able to pick up a symphony of aromas and flavors, um, it actually only has a supporting cast of three other botanicals. So they're all listed here. Um, one of my favorite botanicals, and you see this a lot in both London dry and New Western gins, and that's coriander seed. So coriander seed, uh, which of course we know is the um, seed that produces coriander or cilantro, uh, the plant, the herb. Um, the seed actually has a really nice citrusy flavor and also a bit of a tickle of vanilla. So although there's no orange peel or whole citrus in Tanqueray London Dry, there are a lot of citrus components and that comes from the coriander seed. Um, now, another familiar flavor here is licorice root, but that's not licorice like in the candy that we know of. Rather, the root is, um, I think, more akin to like root beer and sarsaparilla and that sort of root. Um, and what it does is it gives you this earthy flavor, a perception of sweetness, and an oily texture. And again, this is something you find in tons of gins. Finally, we have angelica root, which is um, got more of like an herbal high note and this very floral characteristic. But the interesting thing about Angelica is besides being used in a lot of gins, it's also used very heavily in the perfume industry. And that's because Angelica has this very special chemical property that allows other aroma compounds to attach themselves to it. And some aroma compounds are very volatile, which means that the second you let them out of the bottle, they disappear off into the ether and then you can't smell their beautiful aroma or flavor anymore. But when something attaches to angelica root, angelica root kind of plants itself. So imagine in the perfume business, you'll have these very expensive, nuanced, highly volatile flavors and aromas. They attach themselves to the angelica and the angelica kind of sticks onto your skin and it doesn't go anywhere. So it binds everything together. It's kind of like using um, gluten when you're making bread or having an egg yolk to make some mayonnaise, and that binder allows everything else to attach to it and keeps your flavors all together. So, how exactly is the gin made, you ask? Well, 
Um, first, you should know the original Tanqueray Distillery was in Bloomsbury, which is part of London. Nowadays, however, all of the Tanqueray in the world, no matter where you buy it, is actually made in Cameron Bridge, Scotland. And it's at one of Diageo's most important distilleries where we not only make all of our gin, but we also make a lot of the base distillate for some of our biggest whiskey brands. Um, so although we've moved from Bloomsbury to a uh, higher capacity distillation uh, distillery, um, it's Charles's spirit and original recipe. And in fact, his original pot still have moved up to Cameron Bridge. So the, you have the soul of the spirit in every single bottle of Tanqueray. Uh, well, as I mentioned, the manufacturing process starts with the neutral spirit, which is made in continuous still. That's the one that looks like a chimney. And um, it's the cylindrical still that has all these copper plates inside. What happens is the copper plates stop the heavy particulate that's evaporating um, from escaping out of the top. Rather, it makes it all go in a cycle, so it evaporates and distills many, many, many times, cleaning it and cleaning it and cleaning it before it comes out and condenses back into a neutral spirit, which is pure alcohol that comes out the other end, nearly entirely pure alcohol. Um, anyway, when you take this, it's a pretty boring basic spirit. It's just like a nice neutral vodka, but the magic happens when you redistill the neutral spirit in a copper pot still like the one you see on the screen. So we've got the old Tom still, which looks a lot like the distillery you might have seen if you've ever been to a rum or whiskey or brandy distillery. Now, what happens is when you're in a copper pot still, the shape and the texture and even some of like things that come from the age and the use of the still over the years affects the texture and the flavor of the spirit that comes out. And what you do is you put your neutral spirit inside this pot still and you basically put it in a bath with all of the other botanicals you want to infuse and you distill it again. And now as the spirit is macerating with your uh, botanicals, it's absorbing a lot of their essential oils and aromas and flavors. It's coming out at a slightly lower ABV than it would have in the um, super efficient continuous still. What this means is that some of the oils and aroma and flavor compounds from your botanicals are able to escape from the still with the spirit. And what this does is it gives this amazing texture, mouthfeel, and complex flavor and aroma to your spirit. And that's how we get our gin. But we should learn a little bit more about so guys, Tanqueray we number 10. The Tanqueray still house, where all the Tanqueray in the world gets made. We've got three pot stills that make all this delicious juice. But there's one pot still that's really special to us, and that's the old Tom. We're going to hear from Martin, our distiller here, to see a little bit more about how we make Tanqueray. Hey, mate. Hey, Jack. Welcome. Let's have a look how we make Tanqueray London Dry. Awesome. There's three main components in charging a still. Okay, so first we have demineralized water. So that will go into the still first. Following that, we have GNS, which is neutral spirit. These mix together. You were obviously down at the botanical store earlier on. That is the next process. So we have juniper, coriander, angelica, and licorice. So we wait to still fill up. We'll seal it over, which we're about to do just now. So Jack, you do the honors. Close it up. We're good to go. Let's yeah. fire it up. So we filled old Tom and we fired her up. Now, for me, being in the presence of this beast is really something quite special. It's the oldest pot still in the world that's been in continuous production. And it's in this pot still that all tanker number 10 gets made. So um, pretty happy to be here right now. Let's go over to Tiny 10 and see where we make our citrus heart that makes tanker number 10 so special. So compared to the 12,000 liters of the old Tom still, this wee fella, the Tiny 10, the namesake of Tanker Number 10, is only 500 litres. And it's what makes Tanker Number 10 truly small batch. So in this beautiful little pot still, you can give it a little cuddle. It's where we make all of our citrus heart that makes Tanker Number 10 so juicy and so unctuous. So what goes into our Tiny 10 to make that citrus heart? The key is fresh whole citrus fruit. And here we've got a combination of three citrus fruits. We've got white grapefruits from South Africa, limes from Mexico, and really juicy oranges from Florida. They go in there, all diced up, juice, the skin, the flesh, the pith, all of the oils, and they're gonna go straight into the pot still. 
So now our tiny tent has been filled with fresh citrus fruit. It's time to fire it up. So our tiny tent is going to get to work now producing our fresh citrus heart. That distillate is then going to travel through the distillery into our old tom where we're going to finish off tanker number 10's process. Right, so Jack, the head still has been heating up. Uh, the pine vapours have come across, mixes with the condenser, which turns it back into a liquid. And the liquid, what we're seeing right now, is in the spirit safe. Right, Jack, so what we've got here is pretty close to the finished product. This is the one you made earlier. Okay, so it's going to be good. It's got to be good. Right, so at the moment, this is 85% proof. So what will happen next is it will get taken to a bottling hole where it will get diluted down to bottling strength. You want to have a wee nose of that? Are you happy with the gin? Oh, yeah. Yeah, proud of that one. Let's see, you did well. So, we've... right on. Thanks so much, Jack. Um, so, that's uh, one of the core differences between Tanqueray London Dry and Tanqueray Number 10. We've got our base four ingredients the uh, licorice roots, Angelica, as well as coriander and juniper, but at this point, we're leaving the London dry world and adding all these fruits and also chamomile flowers to the um, base distillate there. And like Jack said, I think one of the most important differences is that we're using whole citrus fruit. Nearly every other distillery in the world that's using citrus is only using citrus peels, which are much easier to work with. Of course, dried citrus peels have a much longer shelf life and you don't have the risk of contamination or bad fruit or anything like that. But by taking the risk and using whole limes, grapefruits, and oranges to make Tanqueray number 10, we can actually add a really unusual and um, delicious juiciness to the cocktail, which is why it's become one of the world's number one most popular and highly awarded gins. In fact, at one of the most challenging spirits competitions in the world, it's the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. We've won double gold and best gin so many times that they've had to retire the brand from the competition. So if you look here, once again, these are the eight botanicals that make Tanqueray number 10 unique. And I love the, the fruit in there, but I also enjoy using the chamomile. And you know, when I'm developing punches cocktails for individual um, creation, or of course, things like pitchers. I really enjoy looking at the raw materials that go into my base spirit and finding some inspiration in there when I want to highlight certain ingredients. So for example, I have a cocktail that is a, a draft version of a Tanqueray number 10 highball that has a bit of cold brewed tea, and just a dash of um, apricot liqueur. And I really wanted to accent the chamomile flavor. So this is something that you could do as a table side serve with your punches or pitchers of cocktails, is I'll take some Tanqueray number 10 and infuse it with some dried chamomile flowers, strain that off and put it into a perfume bottle or a mister. And then part of my table side serve is when I pour everybody a glass of this punch or the bottled cocktail, I have my server bring over this little perfume bottle of the chamomile infusion and spray it onto the side of everybody's glass, which just amplifies one of the ingredients that's already found in the cocktail. And again, it's just one more thing that you can do to elaborate the serve of an otherwise easy to make and dispense cocktail like one of these punches. Now, um, of course, no great gin is um, reached my standard unless it works well in a martini. And it's funny because I'm normally a diehard London dry fan. I love the hair on your chest, grizzly earthiness of the juniper in London, um, London dry gins. But Tanqueray number 10 martini is amazing. And this is our standard recipe, which would be two ounces of Tanqueray number 10 with three quarters of an ounce of dry vermouth. But especially when it's hot and summery out, or if I want to make um, a really nice bottled cocktail that isn't going to break the bank in terms of cost of goods, I also enjoy like a 50-50. So I'll do an ounce and a half each of um, Tanqueray number 10 
and then a combination of dry and blanc vermouths for my vermouth. Um, now, one optional item here would be a dash of orange bitters or even some grapefruit bitters would be nice in this version of the martini. And then you could garnish it with a lemon peel or grapefruit twist, depending on your needs and, uh, or I guess those of your guests. Now, um, one of my favorite things to do is talk about food and cocktail pairings. And this is a great tool to use if you're following the ethos of a wine um, pairing guide or you look at a sommelier, <clears throat> they'll often find wines that have moderate to high acidity, you know, lower to medium alcohol content, and a certain level of refreshment. And if you look at those features of a great wine to pair with food, those are the same features that we talked about in our pitchers of cocktails. So when I'm thinking of a cocktail pitcher and what I can pair with it, well, one of the things that I like to do is a, um, well, like I said, I worked in a Mediterranean restaurant. So one of my favorites would be our um, green tea highball which pairs well with a lot of our um, appetizers and amuse bouches when we have um, big cocktail parties and things like that. So I would pair this green tea and honey highball that has Tanqueray number 10, a dash of lemon juice and the chamomile infusion on it. And um, I would put that with our eggplant, walnut and pomegranate molasses, uh, which is a, kind of served as a little wrap or a bite. And then another one that we would sell a ton of is our um, mule, which we had on draft and either a classic Kettle One Vodka mule or a Tanqueray number 10 Gingin mule. In our case, we would infuse the ginger syrup with some cardamom and we put a dash of apple cider vinegar in with our citrus mix, which is great for bottled cocktails. Like I said, we would pair that with any of our salads or um, fish and chicken dishes because the ginger and cardamom would add a really, really nice spice to the ingredients that we were putting in our dressings or things like a lemon whipped tahini. Um, then we've got things like our punch bowls. And when we would have huge parties, I love making a French 75 punch bowl. And if people are willing to spend the money and uh, rent out the private dining room or the entire venue in your place, then they're usually willing to spend a few extra bucks on an ultra premium punch. So one great thing that I would have was two different levels of the punches. So if we had a whiskey punch, you could get it with bullet bourbon as the base level, or you could upgrade to the bullet 10 year if you wanted to have a more luxurious punch. And the same thing I would do with my Tanqueray number 10 French 75. You could have it topped off with a bottle of Cava, which is a dry Spanish sparkling wine. Or if you wanted to go for the deluxe version, we would upsell you on one with a grower producer champagne to give you that extra touch and make you look like the, um, you know, the very generous host that you are. Now, one of my favorite flavor pairings with that is, of course, going off the classic fried chicken and champagne uh, sommelier favorite. So we would serve our um, crispy falafel, or you might even have something like fried chicken skins or a um, anything else that's salty and crispy would go really nicely with something like Tanqueray number 10 and champagne. All right, now I've got a little demo here. I've actually got two slides. The first one is for a single size version of the cocktail called Princess Buttercup. And I'm going to make that for you here, but then we can also chat a little bit about the full size version, which you might find in a punch. So um, if you give me just a moment to grab a cold glass from the fridge, I'll be back in 10 seconds.
Thank you for your patience. So uh, this is one of my favorite cocktails using tankery number 10. And I'll go back to the slide here that has the single serve recipe. Now, uh, of course, I've got tankery number 10 highlighted at the top, but when I'm making cocktails, and especially something like a bowl of punch or a big pitcher of cocktails with some expensive, always start with the least expensive ingredient first. So I've got some simple syrup. So we're going to work from the bottom up ounce of a one-to-one -one simple syrup. And then this drink, I've got some elderflower liqueur and a bit of um, Campari. So we'll get the elderflower in there and some fresh lemon juice, each and half an ounce. And then we're just doing a little bit of Campari. This is not supposed to be a particularly um, intensely strong cocktail in terms of the bitterness, uh, not like a Negroni or anything. It's more to give it a nice color and just a bit of background, um, a bit of background bitterness and orange flavor. Now, if you look at the recipe here, it's not scaled up exactly. In fact, I've actually cut the lemon juice, the elderflower down a good chunk. I'm using very little Campari in the entire bowl of punch. And when it comes to the dilution, I'm actually going to put in a bit more sparkling rosé to make up for some of the other ingredients. And once again, that's something that you can do as a uh, table side pour just to add a little bit extra to your cocktail and to the service. So we've got our tankery number 10 in there as well. And we'll give this a taste before I shake it just to make sure it's good. And although there's no um, ice in here yet, it's not diluted. When I do a dry taste, I'm really just checking for balance. Can I taste the gin, the lemon, the elderflower, Campari, a bit of sweetness all in balance? In fact, I'm glad that I did taste it because... You know, your lemons and limes change throughout the year. Sometimes they've got less sugar or more. Sometimes they've got less acidity or more. And in this case, my lemon is tasting a bit sweet and not super sour today. So I'm just going to pour in a splash more lemon juice because it tasted like it needed just a bit more sourness. And since it's going to be an individually served cocktail, we do want a little bit of tartness. All righty. So that tastes good for me. I've got some ice here and we'll give this guy a pretty thorough shake. But since we're gonna be topping it off with some bubbles, I don't wanna shake it too thoroughly. Since like I said, even though sparkling wine has alcohol in it, I do count that as part of my dilution. So just cold enough that I can see the tins are frosting over and I'm using pretty big cubes here, so it's not going to over dilute it. And we'll give this a little strain. And then I'm going to top this with a little bit of ice. And I've got some sparkling wine, some rosé bubbles here. And I'm going to do a lemon twist, uh, sorry, a lemon wheel here, but I've also got a lemon peel and I'm gonna just give it a little bit of a zest so that I have some of the lemon oils on top. And you can just discard that, but I wanna give it a really nice aroma. And as you can see, I've got this really gorgeous pretty pink color. And I will say it is really important when you are designing large format cocktails that they can A, last and not change in color or um, separate so much over time. But it's most important that the initial color and presentation are very attractive and something that you're average guest is going to enjoy. So, of course, some people like the more experimental drinks 
or um, something with some kale or some funky whiskey or aquavit in it. And those are fun to make, don't get me wrong, but I do recommend having something that's delicate and pretty and refreshing looking when you're making a really large format version so that everybody likes it and that it doesn't dilute or get ugly or weird over time. Of course, with that being said, you also want to avoid things like egg whites, cream, or anything else that um, needs to be emulsified fully and then can easily break out of emulsion since those are not going to work well in any sort of large format environment. Um, uh, my friend Chandler asks if the name of this cocktail has a story behind it. And I will say this is not my invention. It is from 15 Romolo where I worked for five years. And this cocktail has been around there for at least 10 or 15 years. And I'm not sure exactly where the name comes from. Shame on me. I should know the answer to that. And I don't. Um, but I'll find out Chandler and I'll email you or message you separately and get a little um, feedback for you. Um, anyway, that's the cocktail there. I already went over some food pairings and that sums up the lesson today. But I do wonder if anybody else has any other questions, please put them in now. Um, if not, please um, follow up with us. Tiffany, do you have a survey for today's I do, and I will put that, um, I know that we did have one question early on um, when you were first talking at the beginning about batching. Um, why is it important to avoid the cloudiness that comes from fresh juices or purees aside from visuals? Is there, mm. a, oh, and then there's a second part. Is there a specific shelf life when there's a high alcohol content like tiki? Yes, that's a great question, both of them. Well, I want like with regards to the clarity in bottled cocktails, the idea is that anything that is cloudy or opaque is more likely to oxidize. So those are the parts uh, in a lemon juice, for example, it's the pulp that will oxidize before the actual sugar and acids in the juice will go bad. That's why you want to strain them off, but when you're left say you filter your lemon juice through a coffee filter, which will take a while, but it will happen. Um, what you're left with is a much purer, cleaner uh, ingredient that's mostly just water, sugar, acid, and a bit of the oils and flavor molecules that make up lemon. Whereas the organic matter, which is most of the pulp that's left behind, is the stuff that would technically go bad first. And it's the same thing with um, fruit purees. Like say you've got a passion fruit or a strawberry puree or something like that. The flavor molecules that are in there and also the sweetness and the natural acids that are in that puree can easily be transferred or infused into a rum, whiskey, gin, vodka, et cetera. And then when you strain it off, you're leaving a lot of the organic compounds behind, but most of the flavor molecules have easily been transferred and infused into your base spirit. Um, so yeah, it's really just a matter of extending the shelf life. And with regard to that, I will say the best rule of thumb is when you're making a bottled cocktail, if you can have the bottled cocktail at 25% ABV or higher, it's going to have a really long shelf life. Now, that's pretty strong, I admit. So just using 20 to 25% ABV as a benchmark and aiming for that in terms of ingredients that you want to keep for a long time. So say you make a bottled cocktail where you have an infused spirit. You can infuse the spirit and keep that full strength and keep that for a long time. And then you could make small batches of the bottled cocktail that are already diluted partially, say to only... 15 or 20 percent and you would just want to sell those more quickly and get them moving through the line with as um, rapid a pace as possible but in terms of your homemade liqueurs and infusions 25 percent ABV will basically be guaranteed a very long shelf life anything below that you most certainly want to keep it in the fridge especially if it's a bottle of cocktail and has any sort of fresh ingredient in it um, just to keep it preserved and once again, 
even if you're adding some acids like a clarified lemon or lime juice, I do highly recommend ascorbic acid powder, which is vitamin C powder, and diluting that in some water because it's antioxidative, as well as raw organic apple cider vinegar. You don't want that to be 100% of the acid that you're using, but if it's a part of the acidity, it also has antioxidative powers and it will guarantee a much longer shelf life and just a stabler flavor profile for your cocktails. Uh, so if there are not any other questions, then of course we wanna take this opportunity um, to thank you as well for attending today. We really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you on future um, seminars. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks y'all, see you next time.